Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to 2024 admissions update. This is where we're going to be talking about the trends. Um, we're going to be talking about what actually happened, the results, um, and what we might be able to learn from this admission cycle and what we can expect for the next. So we're going to be uh, getting some very key insights from two institutions that uh, would have, you know, attracted many, many applications this application season uh, and have a lot of experience with admitting and funding international students, particularly Caribbean students as well for our purposes. So I'd like to just welcome right now Frida uh, from the University of Miami, a good friend of ours here at AIM. And I just want to thank her. You'll hear me thank her several times, but we know it is not, a, a, it's not all, a, nobody gets a break in admissions until May the 1st uh, <laughs> when kids um, enroll, uh, deposit and make final decisions. So thank you for your time here, Frida. We really appreciate it. We're also going to be hearing from, from Giles Eady, who is from Emory University, who's going to speak to some of the trends in admission and some of the things that he has noticed in his cycle. Uh, some of the, the trends that we saw coming out um, were, well, of course, this is the first year that affirmative action um, is was not allowed to be used in the process at all. Uh, We've had we've seen many, many articles and articles coming out about how hard it's getting, how students need to brand themselves. New York Times has also been writing about the increasing costs of tuitions. We see um, you know, cost of attendance approaching a hundred thousand. Uh at AIM, we saw a scholarship go over a hundred thousand with all um costs considered. And so the cost of college is a big thing. Deferrals and wait lists on the rise. We're going to get the scoop on those. Um, and early action and early decision. You know, what's, what's happening with that? Um, is That's been increasingly used as well. And then last, and but certainly not least, some new things happening with the whole question of SAT optional, not optional, with some institutions reverting to non-optional policies, meaning required policies, for their students. We are also going to be joined uh, by a couple of um, AIM counselors. Um, Brianna Ellis is here. She's an AIM counselor who um, has worked with several students um, this year who have been admitted to a variety of fantastic schools. And she has some insights to share with us. So it's gonna be a great conversation. So without further ado, why don't we get going? And I will, and then, I sorry, the other trend that we, we just must talk about is, of course, the use of AI in college applications, in essays. Um, and we know Brianna has to share quite a bit about that as an essay coach and as a counselor who has been, you know, chatting with various colleges. Duke University came out and said they're going to be actually using the essay in a very different way. So, um, you know, let's just go ahead and uh, get going with the conversation. So um, I want to start with just getting the insights from Emory University, and then we will move into the live portion of the conversation where right afterwards, uh, you know, we'll ask Frida to just get going, sharing all of this same insight, but from the University of Miami's perspective. Uh, by the way, Frida, Brianna is a University of Miami graduate. So there is that. Um, wanted to just let you know that. Right. So here we go. This afternoon. So thank you again for giving your time so generously. Would you start by just introducing yourself, telling us about your role at Emory, um, and then just diving right into the 2024 cycle and everything you have to share with us. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giles Eady, I'm Senior Associate Dean of Undergrad Admission at Emory University, uh, located in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, there, I am um, the regional representative for the Bay Area of California. Currently, I'm the regional representative for 
all students coming to Emory from the Caribbean. So that does include uh, Jamaica. Uh, so um, been doing this for a while now and um, noticed a lot of things that have happened in the landscape of college admission. Um, and I think that uh, Ms. Campbell, I wanted to um, touch on with you guys. Um, so I'll be glad to do that. Um, I, I think the first thing I'll start off by saying um, is to relax. Um, I, I think that's the most important thing that you can do in this process is to relax. Um, there's a lot of, I, I say, panic that's arising now um, due to more so outside players in the industry as opposed to industry insiders like myself who do this every day. A lot of the panic is stirred up from a lot of news articles that you might see and such um, who have speculation into what we do, but don't actually like know what we do. Um, so I, I certainly start off by saying relax. Um, I think also a lot of the panic comes from, at least for students looking at colleges in the United States, is that they are, a lot of students are limiting themselves and limiting their college search to only a handful of colleges um, that exist of many in the United States. And so what tends to happen is that um, you have a lot of students applying to these handful of colleges, which then drives down admit rates. Um, people often think that admit rates are something that we seek to do, that we say that we're going to only admit a certain number of people, when actually admit rate is just a function of how many people applied to the place versus how many spots we actually have available. Um, Emory, for instance, is we like the size that we are. Uh, we're not going to grow. Uh, we, we don't have any more room to grow. Um, so with more applications that we see and which we've seen um, each of the, the 10 years I've been at Emory, um, the admit rates have gone down. Um, so I, I, I think that... A quick question, on mm -hmm. just to, to play devil's advocate here. Isn't it in the interest of some colleges? You can take your Emory hat off. We certainly don't think Emory would do this, but I do get the impression that some colleges, like when their admit rate goes down, they seem more exclusive. <laughs> they, you know, it creates a furore. They become more desirable. People always want what they think everybody else can't have. And I heard also that it also helps to push up rankings. What say you? Yeah, I mean, those things go into play uh, with rankings. I don't think that, um, I don't I don't feel like a, a true honest admission office is like really driving that. Um, I, I really feel like it, it's for other people to be impressed by. Uh, but oftentimes, and, and this is Giles's point of view, not, not Emory's, but Giles's point of view on it is, when I see low admit rates to at institutions, it tells me that there are a vast swath of students who are applying to the place who aren't necessarily looking for or aren't necessarily a good fit for the place. Um, because there are many other fits that I think that students just neglect because they don't fall under a, a ranking of such. Um, and, and, you know, there's the perceived uh, view of ex exclusivity not there. So, um, I, 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 I imagine it does happen on um, places where that people are happy about low admit rates. But not, um, not at Emory. I, I'll say that this person that works at Emory, it, it does, it's not, Emory. it's I not the, the it doesn't impress me. I'll say that much. Right. Okay. So in terms of the 2024 um, trends, we, we have some specific things we want you to just comment on. Affirmative action was repealed. This is the mm -hmm. first year in admissions where yes. you not allowed to use affirmative action in your process. What would you say was the difference, if any? Really, when we got down to it, it really wasn't much of a difference. Um, contrary to popular belief, and I, I think that the U.S. Supreme Court got this wrong in that they felt that we make admission decisions off of race, and we never did that. Um, no matter your race or your ethnicity, you had to be able to be competitive to come here. We didn't just say because you are this person because you're Jamaican that you're automatically admitted. And that's not the you case. Should. That's what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, it wasn't a big deal for you guys. It, it wasn't a big deal. And it, it wasn't okay. much of a change in how we read. Um, do you we, think that it affected who applied? Did it deter some students or you just you saw pretty good diversity in your pool and you were able well, to? 
to yet to be determined um, yeah. because we're still ongoing with the admission process. We've not been able to see the outcome. Oh, um, yeah, because we need the first. You'll have to see who. Well, actually, later than that, because we do a transfer um, pool as well. So oh, okay. we won't be able to know the demographics, uh, yeah. the racial demographics of the, of the group until we're finished with building the entire class, yeah. uh, which will be maybe later. We'll read up. Maybe you guys will put it out or we'll read about it in one of our favorite publications. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell us about um, the rise of artificial intelligence and the use of that in the in the process, um, especially around the admissions essay. Well, I, I, I think that the AI... Um, AI's interest in essay writing and such, I think it may level the playing field in some cases. Um, I, I think that we may have been a little biased in our admission process for people who are just great writers. Um, and writing, we know, is a skill. It's not, and sometimes a talent that you just have. And I wonder sometimes, have we been neglecting really brilliant students that just might not be the best writers? Oftentimes we see that with our students who are really heavily involved in STEM and tech areas, they might not be the best writers. Um, so we we may have been um, working against those students with the essay approach. So I do feel like AI can level the playing field there. But what I will say about um, an art of AI written essay, um, it is not meant to write the essay. It is certainly a helpful tool to get you going in writing the essay because in my experience, it's been glaringly obvious when a student has used solely chat GPT to write their essay. So it, say it, it again, Laura, for the rest of them at the back, Giles. <laughs> it, they think they're the only ones that know. No, it's glaringly apparent when, when students have used that. Um, oftentimes, the essays look such where they're giving me exact facts about my institution that I published on the website. Um, and almost it's written to the exact letter as the website says. And so that's a way you can tell. And it just, it, the, I guess the other part about it, it just the essays lack a little creativity. You can kind of mm -hmm. tell like, hmm, mm -hmm. okay, this may have been um, AI generated. Yeah. So we can know, we know. Yeah, we know. It's not good. It doesn't help. No, it doesn't help. Does not help. Okay. <laughs> um, tell us about your, uh, early action, early like decision. You have two rounds. You have ED1 yes. and you have ED2 at Emory. Yes. Um, has anything about that changed or surprised you this year? Um, and what do you, who do you think is the best fit in terms of applying ED1 or ED2? An international student needing aid, is that a good round to apply in? Or mm -hmm. um, is it better if you know, you wait if you need a lot of aid for the regular round. Um, are you waiting to see how your money allocation might go? Because I know you are need aware for international students. Yes. And by the way, Giles, I'll tell you this. We have seen a contraction in money for international students, wow. unlike anything. Um, even those schools that used to give a lot of money to international students have just told us, like, they're reallocating, refocusing on domestic low-income students versus yeah. national. It seems to be a general trend. Yeah, um, it's certainly um, in the States, a lot of things that have happened economically that have um, caused that shift, uh, where institutions to maintain the students, the number of domestic students, they have to allocate, reallocate funds. Um, and unfortunately, with international students, that's been a, a place um, that a lot of places have had to pull back on. Um, as far as who should apply early decision one, two, or even regular decision. Um, I, I always feel that a good regular decision student is also a good early decision student. But I think the big difference in the two, uh, and I, I, I put ED1 and ED2 together because they work the same way. Um, the big difference in the two is really going to be the place you want the most. Um, Early decision should only be an application that you submit to the place you really want to attend the most. As I like to borrow from Beyonce, that's the place you want to put the ring on. Um, that is your dream school. That should only be an early decision school. Because with early decision, if admitted, you told us that you're coming. Um, so certainly that needs to be that. A, a slight advantage I think a student has with the early decision pool 
is that the applicants, we tend to have fewer applicants at the point when we're reading early decisions. So there's many more opportunities for admission um, at that point. Um, and also uh, for places that are need aware, um, like us with Emory, um, we, we, if we're going to admit your early decision, that is a, a factor of consideration that we will make. Um, so it, if you're worried about looking for aid um, from those places, I, I think that you need to certainly take that into consideration, but also know that we're taking it into consideration um, as well. Um, so um, if we're, we're admitting you to early decision, that was a factor of consideration um, and something that you need to be prepared for um, in entering. Um, as far as the class that we admit early decision, people want to always ask, well, what percentage of the class you take from early decision? It varies on the year. Um, it's okay. not a set thing, just like the admit rate that we seek to do. Um, it really depends on who applies and when they apply. What um, was your admit rate this year, generally? generally. So admit rate and early decision um, were somewhere like around 23% um, of the population. And overall, the admit rate, when you add um, regular decision, um, we're looking at about 11% um, admit rate um, this year. So certainly, you know, it's more opportunities for admission, but we had a lot of really strong applicants that applied early decision this year. So, so the overall admit rate for Emory is 11%. That's what it's looking like it's going to be this year. Yeah. Oh, that has, I mean, I've been doing this for 14 years and mm -hmm. I've, I've just watched, I've watched a lot of, um, yeah, we've watched the, the, it just go steadily down, down, down. That's, that's, wow. More applicants. <laughs> Wowzers. Okay, yeah. so because that's another trend that we're looking at is the surge in applications. Did you have more applicants this year? What do you think is driving that? Well, I, I think a couple of things. Um, Common App makes it a lot easier to apply to a lot of places. And I also think because students are looking at, like I said earlier, a, a small set of uh, colleges, they're putting in more applications to these places. That's one thing. Um, I also think um, being in a test optional world is certainly created more active. have self-selected out of previously. Um, so that can drive in applications. But um, I, in my 10 years of, at Emory, uh, we've not seen a dip in applications. They've always incrementally gone up wow. uh, in application counts. So. Wow. So speaking of SAT optional, mm -hmm. uh, we saw, we've been watching one by one schools, um, you know, reinstitute the SAT as as a requirement, MIT came out and said, actually, you know, people were saying it was supposed to, you know, it made the process less equi um, like more, it, that the SAT made the process, um, you know, less equitable uh, for yeah. minority kids, for kids who, um, you know, didn't have like lots of this, you know, access to test prep, et cetera. But they have actually found that removing the test um, the test as a requirement actually was uh, negative, played out negatively for those students who can use SAT scores as a lever in their application or as a, a focal point and who would be able to show um, be able to show competence there because not having the SAT gives more weight to things that higher income students have more even more control over than mm -hmm. test scores. So what would you say about that country, John? Well, I think especially at Emory, even when we did require testing, um, it was never a make or break thing. Um, I'd quite frankly much rather see four years of coursework as opposed to four hours on an exam, because we do know that that can be subjective. Um, and, and my advice to students, you know, if you're deciding whether or not to submit a test score or not, it is really first up to you. And then also up to the institution that you're looking at. Um, so certainly, if you are looking at some places that do require the test, you need to make sure you have taken the test. Um, I do recommend that every student, regardless if they're going to submit the test score, take the test just to have it. It's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Um, so that that's my best advice um, with taking the test. But just know that institutions that are test optional, they're truly test optional. Uh, we don't say it just to say we're test optional, but if you do take the test, you get extra points. That's not what we're about. If we truly say we're test optional, we're test optional. 
Um, and and we looks like this year we've admitted about forty percent of our class to Emory that did not have testing. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not a make or break thing for the process. I like to think of testing as like garnishment on food. It, it is not the <laughs> it's not the main it's not the main thing, but it once you have it there, it just it makes the food look more appealing. But if you just had the garnishment and not the food, you'd be upset. But you can get away without the garnishment and have the food and be just satisfied. So that's a good way of looking at testing. Okay, great. Thank you for letting know that. Um, and so from my institutional perspective, there are no plans um, on the Emory side to make uh, the test required. That so you would, would want, anyway. Those conversations are still happening at Emory, okay. um, but we will be test optional next year. So, okay. so you can apply, step on next year, all right. Yep, so fall then, 25 will still be test optional. Okay, and then the last trend I wanted you to just touch on was the waitlist deferrals and tell us, mm -hmm. well, generally speaking, as we've certainly noticed more and more waitlists, more and more deferrals from the early pool, even waitlists right now. Um, do, how do you use waitlists? We know some schools just use it to like take the blow off the no, and the chances of getting off the waitlist are like 0. 0.000000. <laughs> Um, but like, tell us a little bit about, did you notice anything? Did you have more waitlist kids, less waitlist kids, anything about the waitlist and how you use it? Yeah, I think it coincides with application counts. Um, we naturally more applications. Um, you, you might have more waitlisted students. Now I will say waitlist is not the favorite option, um, in early decision, at least at Emory. Early decision one, you actually won't get a waitlist decision. It'll be either admit, deny, or defer. Um, waitlist may come in in early decision two. Um, so it's not the like ideal thing we prefer to do in early decision. But in places uh, like Emory, uh, we have very, very tight, um, I guess, constraints on the number of students that we can have on campus. And so because of that, uh, we're very careful in that the student the class that we admit does not over-enroll. And so um, oftentimes we will under-admit to make sure that we um, don't over-enroll. And then where we might need to fill in students, we look at the wait list. Yeah. And so similar to your admitted pool of students, you got to have a good pool of wait-listed students. Right. So wait -listed, if you need to. Yes, have wait -listed. you gone to your wait list in the past? Do you think you're going there this year? We have gone to the wait list in the past, um, and we are intending on going to the wait list in this year. Okay. But it all comes down to what happens on May 1st, if there's what kind of room is available. The big day. <laughs> yeah, that's the big day. So after May 1st, we'll know how much of the wait list we'll need to use. Mm. Okay, well, thank you so much, Daz. The last question I have is any predictions for the next round of apps and any advice? <laughs> um. So, well, you already you gave the advice at the beginning. You said just relax. That is the biggest Any advice. <laughs> biggest advice I have is to relax. Um, predictions. Um, I, I see certainly. Um, I, I think um, Nicole and I were talking about it earlier. But with the cost of certain colleges, I, I do see that you're gonna you might see increases there. Um, that is a reflection of inflation in the United States, um, and so colleges and universities are not immune to that. But what I will also say is with the rising costs, don't let it be a factor of deterring you from considering these places. Because a lot of the places that have rises in costs do have a lot of financial aid available for students. Yeah. Um, and then also look outside of the the top ranked institution. You're not telling us don't apply to Emory, are you, Giles? That's I'm not, not saying not apply to Emory, <laughs> but I'm also saying if you're looking at Emory, look at some other places too. Yeah, because uh, there are I heard like 1200 different colleges and universities just in the United States alone. Yeah, 4500 um, actually oh, between colleges and universities. There, are there you go. 4500 yeah. that certainly the costs haven't gone up, but could offer great opportunities just mm -hmm. the same as any of the top quote unquote colleges that you, you look at in the United States. Um, yeah. And I, I will say this, the a top ranking doesn't say what it's going to be for you for you it's, yes thank you fit 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 Jeff. fit, fit. Um, you can go to a place that's not ranked at all and then do exceptionally well it doesn't matter absolutely. where absolutely. you went if you're yeah. at the top yeah absolutely i completely concur mm -hmm. I agree. 
Perfect. Well, thank you for your insights. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for your time. We appreciate you. And we hope to actually that you actually will actually come to Jamaica one of these days very soon. We'd be happy to host you. And so you can meet some of our amazing students in real life. Yes, I'm due for another visit. So hope looking right. forward to coming back. Yes, you take care. Thank you again. Appreciate you. It's a pleasure. All righty. Bye. Yes. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Giles. Frida, you are an angel. Thank you for your patience. And so um, I was actually, instead of watching Giles, because I already did this uh, sort of interview, I was watching your face for all the reactions, Frida. I was like, thank God she kept her, um, thank God she kept her video on because I was like, is she not, is she going to her wait list? Then she be like, oh, she's going to tell kids to relax. One, one student told me, She's waitlisted for UM. I just said, I can't even begin to think of another school. UM is all I've thought about ever. And I'm like, all right, okay. It's like, I am a total counselor at this point for real, real. Um, and so let me, let me, let me, let me hand over to you with some of these same questions. What, what were the biggest things for you that you noticed this admission cycle? Any surprises? Were you were you surprised at the number of applications you got? I know overall there has been a surge. It seems to be a surge every single year. Um, and I know that your wait list is now sub 20. Okay. I'm not sure if you want to tell us what it is if you apply early. Um, and we're looking for, yeah, we're looking for all your insights and to just touch some of these same points that, that Giles touched. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Nicole, and the team for having me here uh, to speak to all these students and give them a little bit of an insight, uh, you know, of what we see on our end. Um, I did agree with many of things that he said. Uh, we do see an increase in applications, especially at least at UM at the University of Miami. Uh, we broke the 50,000 um, number of applications. We got over 55, 50, close to 56,000 applications. And like he mentioned, we have a limited amount of space. Um, so we have to keep our class small. Uh, we can admit maybe from 20, 2,100 to about 2,400 students is what we can admit. So if you look at the funnel, right, you're talking, let's say 50,000 applications, and then you have to bring that funnel down, 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 down to 25, 24, 2,300 students. Again, because, you know, we have limited housing and also because I don't think UM wants to get too big, right? We pride ourselves of being a uh, medium-sized institution where we have small class sizes. So we want to keep all that in mind. And yes, also our admit rate has been going down. At least last year, it was 19%. And we do predict that it probably will be a little lower this year because, again, more students are applying, right? More students that have strong applications, right? Overall, they have good numbers, you know, when it comes to the GPA, uh, when it comes to the strength of the curriculum, because they're in an IB program, they're taking AP courses, right? They're taking advantage of whatever the school has to offer and also the extracurricular activities, right? So they are involved, either being sports, model United Nations, they volunteer, they, you know, they do research, all kinds of things that these students do. So we look at all those areas when we're reviewing a file. So like he mentioned, it's not like we only look at your GPA and A. If you have this GPA, you're good. If you don't, you're not, right? So we do look, look at the GPA. We think to us, GPA is important, right? It's giving us idea of the performance of how the student is doing. So in most cases, that's one way of gauging how that student is doing and possibly how successful that student is gonna be when they come to UF, right? So that's one thing. And then again, the, being in an IB, taking AP courses, right? Anything that the school might be extra offering, right? Um, if you're in a national curriculum, well, a national curriculum, we also look at as well. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, the extracurricular activities, right? Are you consistent in the past three or four years? You've been in baseball, right? Or you've been in basketball, or maybe you've been part of um, the chess club, right? Model United Nations, that maybe you started as a member and you moved to a treasurer, maybe a secretary, now you're president, you know, now that you're a senior, right? All those things we take into account. We don't, as much, 
you, on the Common App, you have about 10 choices, 10 activities that you can list. Uh, let's say, for example, I always try, I always recommend that the students list. If you've been doing, if you've been volunteering for the past four years, right, put those those activities first, right? You do a summer program every year, right? That you're consistent year after year, include that, right? Um, you know, some students include a resume, right? Because maybe they want to expand of the different activities, you know, include what, what were responsibilities were, how often you did this, did you do it once a week, two hours a week, you know, five hours a week, did you work? Did you have a part-time job, right? Maybe you go home to help care of your siblings, right? Your younger siblings. So all that, you know, all that you can put on the Common App. Um, I know we talked about the essay. We have two essays um, on our Common App that we use for the University of Miami. The bigger essay, 650 words, and then the smaller essay. For the bigger essay, we have noticed, yes, that a lot of students are using AI, you know, to generate these essays. And in many instances, you know, it's like you'll see that it's clearly the way it's it's um is written, and then there'll be spaces when they say include or add that the student left it blank. So it's like if you know these things that we're noticing is like, well, then you're not paying attention to your essay. Um, you know, when you are doing these this essays. I think it's important the essay is one of the sections probably where we can learn a little bit more about you. You know, we can see a transcript, we can see your grades, we can see your GPA, right? your activities, but maybe the essay is a little more personalized, but you can tell us a little bit about you, right? Um, and, and students write about a million things, you know, they can write about the apps on their phone, right? Um, taking a trip with their grandmother, right? Uh, you know, a lot of times students are writing about what, how difficult it was for the parents, you know, to send you to the school or to do this and to the other, but at the end of the day, all they talk about is their parents. So we don't know anything about the students. So always make sure that when you do that essay, you talk about you and how affected you, right? Maybe you lost a grandfather or a grandmother, you lost a family member, you lost a pet, right? Um, how did it make you feel, right? At the end of the day, I always tell students, when you write that essay, if you I was to put it on a table, right? With let's say eight or nine other essays and your mom or your sister was to read those essays, would they be able to pick your essay? right? So very personalized about you. I always recommend don't don't write anything that it's maybe related to politics or religion as much as possible. Those, those um, topics that might be a little bit controversial, right? The smaller essay, then it gives you a little bit of, of maybe more where you can write about maybe how uh, this year, uh, I believe this past year, and I think it changes from year to year, the prompt was, you know, about resiliency and maybe the difficult situation. How did you work out and came out of that situation? So, um, again, you know, we 650 words, 250 words. So, you know, we also look at it and make sure that you can write a few sentences or a paragraph about something, right? Read the prompt. Pay attention to what they're asking and make sure that you reply or you respond or you give an answer to the prompt, right? So we can see, yes, he was paying attention. Or yes, she was paying attention. So um, we have definitely seen um, or we project, you know, to to have an increase once again on the, the amount of students that we probably are going to admit on our binding plans. That's ED1 and ED2. Um, you know, we've been with all our other plans, we've been increasing, increasing, increasing. Um, but it seems like usually uh, ED1 or ED2 and also um, with our EA, those are the plans where we admit most of our students. We do leave a small amount percentage uh, of our students that are admitted in our regular pool. But again, it, our numbers are increasing so much um, that- so, it, yeah, just, to, just to, to make sure we are hearing you correct and that we go leave with the correct message. Um, in in a in the similar way that Giles said about the early round, it's that look, we're looking at less applications in the early round um, compared to the regular round, um, and so there is a numerical advantage of applying early for the average student. All other things being considered, you apply early, the chances are better. 
Right, exactly. So our ED pools are usually much smaller. Then we have our EA pool, which is a little bit bigger. And then we have our regular pool, which is our biggest pool, right? So so of, if, if you know you, Miami, is it for you like that student that said that's the only thing she's ever thought about, she would do ED. That would maximize her chances. And she's sure. So she's ready to put the ring on it. And then EA, you want to keep some options open, but you want to maximize your chances, you do EA. Um, and and then regular is regular, where, I mean, you know, you have to just face the odds. May the odds be with you. <laughs> right, exactly. So e I usually recommend for ED1 or ED2, if you have the finances or a good, you have a good amount of money, Maybe you are, you know, you know that you're top of your class, you know, top two, three student, right? That, you know, you're probably going to qualify for one of our scholarships because we do offer scholarship and we do offer financial aid for our international students. So if you're like, you know, I'm top of the class, I know I'm going to get a good package, right? I think I have enough money to make it work. I'm going to apply ED1 or ED2, right? Um, if you say, okay, well, I don't have all the finances. I'm hoping to maybe compare packages, right? Um, then apply EA, early action. That is not a binding. You don't have to fill out a contract. You don't have to say, if you get admitted to UM, you're coming, right? Just like ED or ED1. With EA, you have the option to apply to a few more schools. Maybe you are waiting to see what kind of packages you get from each one of these schools, and then you decide, right? Then you commit to whichever school maybe is giving you the more financial aid and the, maybe the best scholarship, you decide, right? When you get to the point of regular decision, like Nicole was mentioning, let's say it's you know 30,000 students that you're competing with. You might be competing with 10,000 students when you get to EA, and you might be competing with five or 3,000 students when you get to ED1. So definitely smaller pool, EA is a little bigger, and when you get to regular, it's a much bigger pool. So of course, you're competing with more students, right? for scholarships on and for financial aid money. So you have to keep that in mind. And these days we are getting more applications with stronger GPAs, with stronger um, curriculums, with stronger you know, extracurricular activities. These applications become complete and then they move through, right? So we are reviewing a lot more applications that we did, let's say three or four or five years ago, right? And again, like um, the representative from Emory mentioned, right? We don't, you know, like I tell Mich uh, Nicole all the time, I don't exactly know why is it that UM is doing, right? That is becoming so popular. With the, with the students from the Caribbean, from Jamaica, it's possible that maybe, you know, we have that vicinity, right? It's easy to get here. The parents know that we're one flight away. And maybe that is something that it's appealing, right? But hopefully we're doing something right when it comes to the programs that we offer, the flexibility that we're offering our students to do, maybe also with the Jamaican students that we have on campus. And then they go back home and they talk about their experiences, right? And how they're enjoying their time at UM, right? Um, but I would say overall, again, maybe UM is not for everybody, but if you decide to apply, just keep in mind that, you know, you have to look at all these things when you're applying and I would always say have an extra school on your list. Don't, just don't apply to one school because then if you, let's say, for example, you don't get in, you, you're waitlisted, then you're like, okay, the, so what do I do now? Now, maybe you want to apply to schools in the U.S., but maybe you want to apply to some local schools, right? Um, you know, and I also say, even if we don't admit you, let's say we put you on the waitlist and we end up not going to the waitlist, which this year we always, you know, in the past, we excuse me, we've always gone to the wait list, but it's a smaller amount of students that we take off the wait list. Um, but if we're not able to get you off the wait list and you're still all set and coming to UM, there's always the option to transfer. Maybe you go to the University of the West Indies for a year, right? And then you transfer to UM and you can finish your degree here. Um, it, you know, the University of West Indies uses the grading skill we use, using the grades that we use. So that is always an option if you don't get in as a first year student. But I would just keep that in mind, you know, when you are deciding what is it that you want to do. But the wait list, we also always wait until after May 1st yes. to decide because, you know, we give the deadline to the students that we've offered admission to pay their deposit, right, oh, to commit yeah. to attend UM. So right. by May 1st and May 2nd, we're like, okay, it looks like we might still be short on the class that we have to um, commit to. So let's see. Let's look at our wait list. Let's see who has shown interest, right? 
Maybe you send a letter of continued interest, right? Maybe you mentioned like this, this uh, student is saying, you know, UM is my top choice. So I am ready to commit to UM if you admit me, right? So send that letter. Let us know that, yes, you are committed that if UM, you know, if we give you that call from the wait list and say, hey, we can open a spot for you. Do you want to come? That you're ready to say yes. Well, yeah. we'll give you 24 hours or 48 hours to talk it over with your parents. But um, so. Also I hearing from both you and Giles that um, it's advisable to spread a wider net. Uh, make sure that you have various options and not just the highly competitive options. The question I have for you, Frida, is when you're you're looking at students, you just said with higher GPAs and higher scores, and you know, you're looking more attractive on paper. Um, this is the, what role does ability to pay for an international student pay? I mean, sorry, play if you will, if you've got two students of similar profile, both very strong, um, and you know, one student can afford to pay completely or pay way more than another student. So one student would be way more expensive for you to admit. This is something I try to explain to parents all the time. Um, can you just tell us what role that plays? Yes, well, I can talk a little bit about it. We Unfortunately, we have a limited amount of scholarships and a limited amount of money that we can give to our students, right? So we wish we could give scholarships to all our students that apply that we feel that they're competitive, right? But unfortunately, we can't. So one thing that we look at is how much with this student will cost us, right? For us to bring. We have um, what we call, or this is a new initiative that our president, um, you know, wanted to have started in order now next year that we gonna be a hundred years old for us to meet 100% of demonstrated need for all those students that we admit. So if we offer you admission, right? We will find a way to give you either scholarships or grants or whatever money that is that we need to give you to make it affordable for you to come. So students, international students do fill out what we call the financial certification form. And that gives you a little bit of a guide of, okay, my parents can contribute $10,000, $40,000, right? So we have an idea how much money you're bringing in. Maybe you're getting a scholarship from AIM, right? Or you're getting a scholarship from the government in Jamaica, right? And you're bringing it with you. You can put it on that form. So we have a little bit of an idea that if we want to offer you admission, how much money do we have to give you for you to attend UM, right? So if we uh, we have scholarships that pay full cost of tuition, full cost of attendance, and we have our precedence of scholarships that I think go up to maybe $28,000, $30,000, somewhere around there. So that's yeah. a little bit of a, a good chunk of money. Um, that a student can receive, right? And in addition, if you say, well, my parents can afford this much more money, then we can look at it and say, okay, this is a student that probably we can fund and we right. will offer you, like I said, scholarships and uh, grants, which usually international students don't have to pay back. Thank you for that. Sometimes kids want to just get the admit letter so they feel great about it, but then they can't pay for the school. And if you can't pay for them to come, then basically you're now then admitting a student who you know can't come, which it's is a wasted offer. It's a wasted offer. So we, we really want folks to get this very uh very clear that you know, you know, you have to I have to talk to students about the fact that some of these things you can't take personally. If you had, you know, 65 grand to pay per year, you would have been admitted to this school. So, you know, you don't have to feel like, oh my gosh, this is a rejection of me as a person. Um, no. no, sometimes just about dollars and cents. Um, Frida, I want to ask you, did affirmative action um, and all the talk of legacy, non-legacy, did that affect you guys at all in, the, in your um, process? Well, like at, like at Emory mentioned, we don't we're not looking at the students uh, based on the race to offer them admission, right? When we 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 try to make sure that these kids these students are well rounded, so it doesn't matter if you're white or black or red or yellow, right? We want to see are you a good student, right? Are you um you know doing taking advantage of the best things that you can take advantage of while you're in school, right? Are you are you gonna be a change maker? Does it, you have to be white to be a change maker? Do you have to be black to be a change maker? No. So, you know, you might specify on your, um, on your essay, you might specify on the activities that you're involved in. It will give us an idea, maybe what your race is. But at the end of the day, 
you know, we we try to admit the best the best possible class that we can. And we're not looking at the race as, as, oh, well, they're from this race, so we should admit them, right? Or that's from this race, oh, we shouldn't admit them. If you look, let's say our, our profile, you would see how we have a diversity of races. And, and I think it has affected us very little. But again, there is some scholarships that we have or some events that we had that we had them specially for maybe a particular race that now, you know, that might affect that population. And I think at the end of the day, we might be admitting maybe less uh, of a certain population because of course we can't um, we can't do many of the things that we could do before. So maybe a little bit I would say has affected us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think overall we're, we're trying to do our due diligence, right? Yeah. Um, to try to, and you know, like Emory talked about testing. We plan to be test optional for 2025. Um, so that is something that, you know, students uh, can take into account, even though, you know, we know that some schools are back to being, you know, you have to submit testing, you know, as part of the application process. Well, and I would say no, that I have you live because when I'm looking back and listening to Giles, I was like, I wish Giles was here so that I could. And I know you all are restricted in what you can say, but the truth is it does not take a rocket scientist to put the pieces together that if there are many plates of food. Let's just use Giles, let's use Giles analogy. Let the follow me for a minute. If there are many plates of sumptuous, delicious, nice smelling, attractive looking food, there are 10 plates and your stomach only have space for to eat three of these plates. <laughs> you are more than likely, everything smells similar and looks similar. The ones with the garnish for a little bit of space in your tummy, you're probably going to be attracted to the ones with the garnish. So if a high SAT score is the garnish in a highly competitive process, especially for an international student where money is limited, I mean, I mean, you, I, we can put, let's just put the pieces together here. I mean, for me, I would prefer for an institution to say to a student, we are test blind. We do not like the U, like the University of California system where it's like, don't send us any scores. We're not even looking at them. Adios. But the fact that they are being used in a highly competitive process is enough for me to say, and I mean, Giles said it, do it. It's better to have it than not to have it. But it's enough for me to say, if you want to stand the best chance, get the highest score because we need garnish. Yeah, I, I will agree with that. I would say that, you know, at least at UM, the way we did it in, in the past, or at least the past few years, it's been we're trying to be consistent about 50% of our mids had testing and 50% of our mids didn't have testing, right? So we've been trying to to stay on that 50-50. But I would say, yes, I would agree that if you were able to take the test, take the test. So you have an idea what your scores are. You have competitive scores. All of our institutions have websites and it would say this is the range, right? 1350, 1380 to, I don't know, 1450, let's say for the SAT or 30 to 33 for the ACT. If you fall within those ranges, it's worth sending that testing. If you have a 1200 and 1100, don't send it. That's not going to help you. It's only going to help you if it's a good number, right? But it's not going to help you if you send a low number. So like, I think I do agree with Nicole that, of course, that would be an extra column that we look at if you submit testing. If you want to make that application a little more competitive because you are looking for a good scholarship, then maybe you need to submit that testing. Apply yourself, get a good score, and then send it, right? If you, you know, otherwise, you know, again, we do 50-50 when it comes to testing. Um, if you say you don't want to be counted, don't send it. Don't mention it. We're not interested, right? Don't tell me you're not interested, but then you submit the testing and it's at 1100. And you're like, why are you sending it? Do this. Why do you because do this? many students feel that, oh, I won't qualify for a scholarship. I won't qualify for financial aid because I'm not submitting testing. And yeah. that's not the case. You could be considered for scholarships. You could be considered for financial aid, even if you don't submit testing. But I do agree that if you want to make that application a little bit stronger, then it's worth sending the testing as long as you have a good number, you have a good score. Okay. What That's is your so prediction on how AI will affect how the office looks at essays in years to come? I just think that um, 
it's it's unfortunate, like I said, that we are starting to review these essays and we realize that this is not written by the students, right? Um, and like I said, many of them are very sloppy when it comes to, like, you know, the essay is produced, they put it there. There is sections where they, you know, the essay will say insert activity and it's left blank. And you're like, wait, what? Or insert name of the university and they leave it blank. And you're like, oh, wow. So definitely we always put a note, you know, on, you know, in our comments when we're reviewing the files, like, you know, about the essay. Um, so Are that's those why, not accepted, would you say, or? Uh, definitely, you know, it's something that yeah. the committee at the end of the day will review, um, you know, uh, as they make the final decision, if, if they feel that it's worth, you know, admitting that student, um, you know, a lot of times is they're very strong. And I know Nicole also mentioned the the fact of the legacy, right? We, if a student is pretty much the same, right? And then one is legacy, maybe because a parent, a grandparent, a brother, a sister, I think that gives them that little pump, that little extra um, plus, because then we see that there's that affinity, right? Hey, your dad went to UM, and it looks like if you get admitted, you're going to come to UM, right? So that gives you that little bit of affinity. So I always tell students, mention that, you know, if your legacy because of your parents, your grandparents, maybe your brother or sister is currently attending, mention it. But yes, that AI is something that we're looking, and I don't know if, you know, how things are going to be for next year. Um, if maybe we are going to penalize these students, right, for for what they're doing. Thank you. I always find that interesting. Um, we really want to encourage students to put out the best in these essays and understand that it's their, your opportunity to get to know them and not yes. just think to be completed. And I think with the rising applications, students are just kind of looking to get it done as opposed to mm -hmm. find, doing Spending the that little extra yeah. time. Yeah, out. it's it's it, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. And like I said, I think for the students that are really interested, right, that they will take the time and the effort to write it and maybe have a, a counselor or a teacher or somebody review it, right? To make sure that it makes sense. And I always tell students, you know, don't write about what you think that I want to hear, right? I, use your words, write your story, right? Have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? You want to use a little joke, you know, you want to be funny. Definitely you can do that, right? But it's, again, about you. And, you know, we've been doing this for long enough that you start reading something and you're thinking, I wonder if this kid wrote this this essay or who wrote this essay that this student is submitting, right? And, you know, at the end, they do, when they finish the coming up, they say that all this information is true and correct. So you're like, okay. Got you. Well, I, <laughs> I can only imagine what it has been like in the office this year. Thank you so much for your insights and everything that you said. We really appreciate it. We are just about at the hour mark, but I want to open the room for any questions that we may have because as Mrs. Campbell said, UM was is really on our students' lists and just a school that everyone is targeting, which I'm so biased because I think it's the best school in the world. You can't tell me otherwise. Um, I've, I, I had such a great experience at UM. Does anyone have any questions that we can throw out to either myself, Mrs. Campbell, or Frida while she's with us? I just want to put a note out there while we take the questions. Um, can you put the questions in the Q&A, not in the chat? It's so hard to follow questions that go in the chat. We're just begging to use the Q&A box. And while you're getting in the questions, I just want to make a general um, kind of commentary on some of the trends that we saw uh, from our perspective as counselors for students throughout the Caribbean and indeed that's for students who are attending and living um, in, in various states across the United States. So one thing I definitely say is the landscape is more competitive than it's ever been for sure. Um, in terms of money, I said this while I was on with um, Giles, it's a tougher, tougher space uh, in the U.S for international students who need substantial funding. Uh, and, you know, we are seeing that our students who can pay, you know, $20,000, $30,000 do much better than our, our students who can't, um, all other things being considered. And if you really want a college to pay 100% of the cost for you to attend as an international student, then you really have to um, you have you have to really bring it. 
you dot all the I's, cross all the T's, all the possible garnishing. You have to have a hook. It has to be a very compelling profile. I will also say that even for highly competitive students, when you apply to institutions that have 3% admit rate, 4% admit rate, 5% admit rate, you know, again, spread, spread, your, um, spread your net wide. You know, there, there are students who will get into Princeton and not get into a Johns Hopkins for different reasons. Um, there, there are students who will get into a Princeton, but not into a Yale, even though, you know, roughly you would think, okay, yes. So you do have to spread a wider net and be aware of what is a fit. Colleges are also looking for fit. So sometimes you don't get into a college and it's not because your grades weren't good, et cetera, but they're looking at fit. The other thing is in a highly competitive environment, and Frida, you can tell me what you think, but I have heard from schools and they're using things like what the teacher recommenders say. They might be on the brink of admitting you and there's something in that recommendation letter that raises a red flag for them. And they're just like, no, because there's another person with a similar profile, with a, you know, whatever, 1,580 SAT score, with a 4.0 GPA and all this leadership. And the teachers think they're delightful versus your teachers who are raising some, 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 some red flags here. And I think that colleges and admissions officers have to think about who is likely to be successful here and graduate in four years um, from our institution and, you know, you have to hedge your bets that way as well. So, you know, um, we, we definitely uh, saw where it was harder for money for, for students who could afford very little. You have to have like a super strong profile if you are not a U.S. citizen or resident. And even with a strong profile, there are some times where you're going to get waitlisted or not even get into a school at all. And it could really have been anything. Uh, yes, I do agree with Nicole. Um, I think it's important that you keep that in mind, um, that if you have the funding, remember, we have to issue an I-20 for you if you're an international student, you're coming to Miami. So you need to submit a different kind of, um, a, a specific, specific amount of funding for us to issue the I-20 according to the United States. So you're not a, any burden for the university, you're not a burden for the United States. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, now, some of you might, I think there was a question on the chat that asked, well, what if, let's say, you know, your grandmother lives here or your parents have a house here, and then, you know, you're not going to live on campus. So the tuition and fees are the same for everybody. Being that we are a private institution, it doesn't matter if you're coming from Jamaica or you're coming from New York or you're coming from China, you're going to pay the same, right? Because we are a, a private institution. But when it comes to the housing, the, the food, the books, everything else, it might be a little different. You might still have to show a certain amount of money for your I-20 purposes, but when you get your tuition fee, you will realize that it's a little different that if you're, let's say for example, you're not staying on campus, you're requesting a waiver because your mother lives here, your father lives here, they have a house here, uh, or maybe you're gonna stay with a nun or an uncle or whatever. Um, and somebody else mentioned about having a, a gap year before gap you year? go to the gap year question, I also just want to say, and I, um, I don't want anyone listening to generalize that. That is specifically for, for UM in terms of some schools do have a requirement for freshmen to live on campus. And so there is no kind of, oh, my aunt lives over there. Um, it depends. Some schools will say within a certain radius, the house has to be this mm -hmm. close to campus mm -hmm. for it to be waived. So it really, really depends. Um, and so... For UM, you definitely have that option and you might want to look into what that is like at any other institutions that you're applying to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, yes, gap year. Go mm -hmm. for it. So uh, usually uh, we want to just to see, you know, if you decide to take time off because you're traveling, you're volunteering, you're working, right, to make a little money, to save money. As long as you put it on your coming up, right? You graduated in 2024, but you decided to, you know, um, work or maybe you're starting a new business or, you know, you want to be a blogger, right? And then you're going to apply a year later. So that should not be an issue. Um, we always want you to, again, mention what is it that you plan on doing for that year while you're out of school, right? Um, keep in mind that if you decide to say, oh, you know what, I'm going to go to the university and then, you know, do a couple of semesters and then I'm going to go to UM. In that case, you will be considered a transfer student. 
uh, because you're bringing, you know, you you finished high school, you went to another institution of higher education. And then, of course, the when it comes to financial aid, when it comes to um, scholarships, all that is going to be much less that a transfer student will receive We that if you are um, applying as a first year student. So just keep that in mind, right? If you're graduating in December and you know you're not coming to UM until August when, you know, the semester starts, we need to know that gap of more than three months, right? That is usually the summer. We need to know what is it that you plan on doing? What is it that you're going to be doing? Um, let's see what else. Not video games and um relaxing your body because you know school. And so <laughs> um, and, uh, you're muted, by the way. Oh, okay. I'm also mm -hmm. replying to questions as well. We won't just in case. Um, so does acceptance rate? This is a really good one. Does acceptance rates differ based on the courses or degree the student wants to pursue? So essentially, are some of the schools at UM more competitive? Than yes, us? and that's a very good question. And I would say yes. If you are applying to our business school, that is our most popular school that we have. Therefore, I would I always suggest students either the business school or the Frost School of Music are our top schools that are high percentage of students apply to. So it's very competitive. So I would say, if you want the business school because you want accounting or finance or any of those majors, make sure that on the Common App, you put a second major in a different school or college. And the same goes for Frost. If you have Frost School of Music as your first choice, and keep in mind that if you're applying to Frost, you have to uh, submit an audition, right? Either because you sing, you play an instrument or whatever the case may be. So put a second choice in your common app. So my first choice is music, but if I have a second choice, it'll be communication, it'll be engineering, it'll be psychology, whatever. A different major in a different school or college. So don't say I want business because I want accounting as my first choice and finance as my second choice. If the business school fills up, they're gonna not going to take any bet. Like Nicole mentioned, not because you have a bad GPA, not because you know, you're a bad student, they don't have any more room to take any more students. So you put accounting, but then put communication, put engineering, put psychology, put something else as a second choice in a different school of college. When you start at UM, you could be taking classes, let's say in psychology and in business. You have until your second year to decide, okay, I really like business. I really like accounting. I'm going to keep accounting and I'm going to change my major. Or maybe you say, you know what? I really like psychology. I'm going to stay with psychology. Maybe I'll do a minor in accounting, you know, but you have that option once once you're at UM. Agreed. Um, I would say this generally as well, where definitely some majors are more popular than, um, more competitive than others. Right. And also, you, you and, and this is not us just, um, encouraging you to just choose a major that you think <laughs> is going to be less popular so that you can get in and then switch because... I think, and and uh, Frida, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you can see when passion aligns with coursework, aligns with extracurricular activities, aligns with goals. So it's about the holistic picture. Um, mm -hmm. and so really just preparing the best application for the major that you actually want um, is definitely what's going to be most beneficial um, coming in on your freshman year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think somebody was talking about extracurricular activities. I mean, we want you to be well-rounded, right? So if you can play a sport and you can also be in a club and you can also volunteer, I mean, you are doing three different things, right? So it's not like, you know, we have students that are really good and they play sports year-round, right? And that's all they do. There are three, three type of students that, regardless of the season, right? So I always say, if you have the option, right? and you can play a sport, that's great. But if not, maybe you play chess, right? But you also volunteer, right? But you also, you know, I mean, do research, right? Uh, you work, right? So as long as it's not all the same thing, right? And when we talk about this holistic review, I mean, we might have a 4.0 student, you know, 1500 SAT, and there's no extracurricular activities. So we're like, okay, well, I don't know if he would be a good fit or she would be a good fit for you. Maybe we're looking at somebody has a little bit of a lower GPA, right? 
but they're involved, right? They're a volunteer, right? They're in their community. They volunteer at a pet shelter, right? They do, you know, maybe they help students, you know, in elementary school to read, to write, to learn a language, right? So we would probably look closer at that student that has a little bit of a lower GPA, but has involvement, right? Has other things that we look as well. I just want to jump in here. Thanks so much, Frida, um, for a second. Just to remind everyone here that Frida um, is obviously from the University of Miami. She's speaking to uh, obviously things about the University of Miami and their admissions process. I want to just emphasize and make it very clear that different schools look for different things and make decisions based on different factors, okay? So for example, the University of Miami is a private school. They're definitely looking at, in a, at a, um, you know, in a holistic manner um, at students, right? But there are some, some schools that are public universities that are really just looking at scores and GPA. And that's mm -hmm. really how they're making um, decisions. They're able to admit maybe many more students and that's primarily what they're looking for. I think it's really important to understand what the school you are applying to is looking for. And at the, at the school that you're applying to, what is what are the majors that are most popular and therefore maybe most competitive to get into and where you have other other um where other strengths might be. So I just want to just emphasize that um different schools require slightly different approaches depending on um you know who they are what they're looking for what their institutional priorities are um so university of Miami just they're turning 100 next year now they want to meet 100 percent of need and um, generally speaking like jazz indicated there's a lot been going on in the u.s from a socioeconomic equality that whole conversation has been very big and, and u.s schools want to use financial aid to level the playing field in the united states um not globally Right. So that's why you see more funding going to domestic students versus international. So I just think that that's really important to just give that kind of context that and the more competitive the school gets is maybe the more they are looking for things like um, distinctive things about a student where they've maybe gone above and beyond in a specific area. Yes, they do other things, but there's one area where they've gone in really deep and, and can show, you know, some kind of passion, some kind of, you know, um, achievement, some initiative, some commitment, some impact. And, and that is the definition of a hook. Somebody was asking in the, in the, um, in the comments. So I think it's really important to just recognize too you know, and, and we have this with students every year. We, we look at their interests and we say, well, maybe it might be interesting for you to do this or interesting for you to do that. They don't want to do it. It's too hard, this, that. They come up with something else. Maybe it has less impact. Then they don't get into the schools that they want. And then they wonder, oh my gosh. I would say that you just need to recognize the environment that you're in. It is highly competitive, more competitive than you can possibly imagine. So if you really want to, you know, um, play at that level, then you're going to have to go above and beyond and it's going to be feel a bit more difficult or hard of building out that profile. But you want to you want to get that decision and know I did everything possible to 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 ensure the result that I want. The truth is, colleges don't want to say no to a lot of these great applicants, but they just they don't have a choice. They don't have the space, and they have too many applications, and that is the reality that we're facing. So I would say, um, I would say that, you know, distinguishing yourself in the pool of many amazing applicants is especially important these days, that little garnish, the little extra, the little thing that can, you know, sort of um, make a difference is important. So, so because somebody was asking about hooks and um, I don't think it's essential that you talk about your hook or your thing in your essay if it's present other places in the application and you maybe talk about it in a supplement, but what do you think, Frida, because that is a question? Like I said, you can, I mean, we're looking at a, an essay that you, it, it, it's yours. You're talking about it, right? But for us, we're not admitting you based on your essay alone, right? So you need to have good grades, right? You need to have, let's say, you're in an IB program, taking APs, whatever the case may be. So we are looking at several areas, right? extracurricular activities, right? We want to see that you're involved, right? That you are doing several things and hopefully in different areas, right? Not just sports, not just, you know, volunteering, but a little bit of everything, right? To see that you are a well-rounded student, right? 
Um, so those are the things that we look at. So yes, the essay is definitely important because I think that's the section where you can tell us a little bit about yourself, right? And maybe we get to learn a little bit more because at the end of the day, we can have the 4.0s, we can have the 1500 SATs, right? So if you can tell us a good story, right? And again, it has to be your story, right? Um, or an interesting story that you might have that you want to share with us, right? So again, not... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say don't be sloppy and write three sentences and think that that's, oh, they're not going to look at it. So yes, we do. We do it. And just like Nicole mentioned before as well, the recommendation letters. A lot of times the, the recommenders will give us that extra information that we see a dip on 10th grade, but we have no idea because the student is not saying anything, right? And then the, maybe then, you know, the counselor would say, oh, please keep in mind that in 10th grade, the student had a car accident. They had to spend four months in the hospital and they couldn't take a lot of their courses and whatever, whatever, whatever. And we're like, oh, okay, that explains it why. Maybe you're an A, B student. All of a sudden you're a C student and you're like, hmm, I wonder what happened. But the student doesn't tell us. So we don't know. So a lot of times we look at those recommendation letters to hopefully fill out the gaps. Please make sure that you include your activities, right? A lot of times students don't tell us and then they send a resume with a million things, right? Or the recommendation letter is the one that tells us, oh, yes, they're, they're involved in dance and they're involved in, in swimming. They do track and field, right? Whatever is it that they do. So, um, uh, there's a question about the SATs. I know that sometimes students feel, as an admission officer, if, if we see that you are a 4.0 student, you know, you are inventing the new technology, we're thinking, I wonder if that student would come to UM, right? Because then we see how competitive you are. And then we're, we feel that, oh, they might get five, 10 offers, right, of admission, right? And they're just going to have to decide where they go. But I think at the end of the day, if you are a competitive student and we can offer you admission, we will offer you admission. I have one question um, for you, Frida. Do you reject students who you think aren't going to come because their profile is so much stronger than your typically admitted students? Although at this point, you're getting such strong students, I don't even know what that might mean. But I know <laughs> I know that there are some schools that are doing that. It's obvious. And so sometimes we have these really exceptional kids where we want to give them a wide range of options because, yes, it looks like you'll be great for Harvard, but what if you do not get in? So let's spread the options. And then we are seeing where, yes, the student may get into the Harvard, but then get rejected from a school that's, you know, typically much easier to get into. But what if Harvard did not take that student, for example? They would have no school to go to. Um, how, how, mm. like, how does that kind of, do you, do you look at that and say, well, they, we're not going to yield this one, so let's not make the offer? Well, sometimes that is the, the case, or maybe the student even says, you know, well, I, you know, in their essay, they talk about how they apply to other schools, right? Or they receive oh, no. offers. I know. And you're like, really? No, no. What is going to do? Students do it. You know, it's like you see, you know, you see all kinds of things, um, you know, or they apply to us, but they say University of Florida I would be, love to be part of University of Florida. And you're like, damn it. But anyway. Um, I think there is a small percentage of some of those students where they are perfect. There is nothing wrong with them, right? That you say, I wonder if we will yield these students if we offer them admission. But I mean, I would say that the majority of them, we will offer admission. And if not, sometimes, you know, we wait list them and see if, if they, they are. Get serious. Yeah. Good trip. Yeah, yeah. If they get serious and say, yes, I'm committed to attend UM. If you admit me, you know, UM is my top choice. Right. So then we see if they have that interaction and their affinity and they, they want, they have that continued interest. Then, you know, we definitely have them at the top of the list to, to get them off the wait list as soon as we can. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you for answering that for us. Wonderful. All right, that's all the questions. I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> all the questions. Thank you, Brianna. Yes, of course. Thank you, Frida. Thank you, Frida. Thank you, Giles. And thank you to every parent and student who is on with us now. Um, uh, if you are in the class of 2025, 20, 
26, you get a chance to use these lessons learned. If you're in 2025 and you plan to do a gap year, you also have a chance to use these lessons learned. If you're in the class of 2024 in this, in this session, in getting where you wanted to, then you know remember that that's not a marker for your life success. You make the best of wherever you are and whatever options are in front of you. And uh, this process has become more and more, I would even call it cutthroat these days. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel, which I will be bringing on a few Canadian schools to talk about, is I've seen Canadian schools giving more and more money than they ever have freedom. So at least students in a general sense do um, have more options um, in some ways. So I just want to thank you again. Um, thank you, Brianna. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, if you have any other questions that we haven't addressed here, feel free to hit reply to any of the numerous emails we sent inviting you here. And we would be happy to answer um, any of your questions, set up a meeting, give you support in any um, number of ways. The summer is coming up. I urge you to use it use it wisely and we'll be talking about how you can do that a lot next week wednesday webinar and so thank you and we hope to see many of you in our webinar next week frida we appreciate you good luck um i hope you yield a hundred percent of all the students thank you thank you thank you from all your right. lips to god's ears so all we right. can have a, a fun summer and we can come visit in the fall Absolutely. You know, you're always welcome here. I don't know if you want to do any more recruiting. Can you manage any more applicants is really the question. I don't think you, <laughs> think you could not come to Jamaica for five years and still <laughs> have more students. I really do. I really do. Good problem to have, Frida. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you to both of you for having us. And, you know, anything we can assist with, we'll be happy to, to assist. We appreciate you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.